wisdom. It was a wisdom for Labor Day. Uh, yeah. and, and the greatness of labor, hard, sweat, backbreaking labor, as it's respected in Jewish tradition, not sitting hiding in the yeshiva all day. So I have two strikes going on simultaneously outside my window where I live. Two strikes, not one, but two. So we live across from one side, we see Fox Studios. So every time I go out of the driveway, I see the pickets picketing the studio, the, the actors and the writers who keep us entertained and challenged. And now they're facing a very critical time. Modern technology is upending their kind of work. Just as the introduction of, introduction of film which they benefited, upended the career of live stage actors and playwrights in the years before there was film. Well, that's called um, creative destruction, uh, one of the classic uh, theories of economics, which is that you destroy something and out of it comes something greater. Well, are we going to destroy the writers and actors and come something greater? My robot will tell me. Then they are what we call the white collar workers. They're middle, upper middle class. The strikers are very polite and quiet. They just walk back and forth. And I really would expect something more dynamic and dramatic from really in the picket line, especially people who are really talented and creative. That's why they're in that line, but they're just walking. On the other side of our window, I face a major hotel. And very often it's quieted down. Now in the morning, 6 a.m., I would hear loud drums and the blare of loudspeakers and whistles and waking up everybody for at least a mile around. We wanted to make sure that the hotel residents knew what was happening, and I certainly knew. And they're the service workers of the hotel industry. And what I will say it's annoying. I will say that this approach fits, approach fits people who work physically very hard for the daily bread. If you have to be... Uh, cleaning lady in the hotel room and you have to change the linens on the king size mattress that's hard work and i will give them credit because they are the being creative and talented in the way they're handling the strike they're not supposedly the creative and talented. they're making it it's interesting the blue collar so i don't want to disparage people who write or sit at the desk for a livelihood like i do but then during the pandemic it was the other people the ones who work with their hands and feet very hard, who made sure food was served to children in the school. Even the teachers had the luxury of leaving class for the safety of home, teaching long distance. But the people who worked in the building making the kids fed couldn't. And the people who made sure that deliveries were made so stores could have supplies so people could buy food and necessities. Also, such hardworking people also bore the brunt of infectious diseases during the COVID pandemic because they tended to live in cramped houses and have to suffer the effects of being at work with other people who may bring the virus with them and bringing whatever they picked up at work through no fault of their own and taking it home. And there is the grandma and grandpa who are elderly and vulnerable. So we owe an awful lot to people who work physically to make our civilization flourish, while the rest of us frankly sat home, had our cafe latte, sat in on mind numbing, often unproductive Zoom meetings, as I have seen and observed and watched and sat in on. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the complaint when they have to go back to the office. I know. I see it. So in honor of people who put in a hard day of labor, honest labor, I want to show some aspects of Jewish labor laws and ideals. So as a compendium on Jewish law, which is available in English, summary of all Jewish civil and criminal law, uh, by Menachem Elon, a Supreme Court Justice. He's a rabbi professor on Jewish law, Hebrew University, Harvard Law, New York University Law. Labor law and scripture, the two fundamental principles in the labor law and the scriptures, the master has to pay the servant on time and right, repeated. Not, the wage of the labor may not remain with you until the morning, it's repeated several times, right? Timely payment, timely payment. Uh, secondly, the servant's right to eat from the produce of the field he's working on. When you enter your neighbor's vineyard, you may, if you desire, eat your fill of grapes, and, or when you're in the field, pluck your grapes, right? What you as a laborer are working on, you may have a small amount, a fair amount. And that doesn't mean that if you're the clerk in the store, you can take in your pocket the, uh, the extra makeup that's there, but no, right? But this was the, the labor working hard. He couldn't get to... 7-Eleven to get something. He's in the field. So you let him, right? 
uh, so from these principles like this, we have also the principle of the Hebrew bondsman, uh, the servant, the slave. Also, out of these, we develop Jewish labor laws. So we come up with concepts like the difference between a hired servant, a wage or daily laborer, and independent contractor. Important distinction. One of principle. One is hired for a specific period. You will work from nine to five. Monday through Saturday, Monday through Sunday, Monday through Monday. That's hired labor. The contractor, you will accomplish X, Y, Z. I will pay you. you it's on your time to do it. Um, there's a Roman distinction. I'm not going to read the Roman. Okay, the Latin. Time factor. In the hire of a servant, there's effect of tying him to his work for fixed hours, during which he cannot choose not to work. Whereas the independent contractor may work as and when it pleases him. That's the distinction. So according to Maharam of Rothenberg, great rabbi in the 1400s, I think. Hence, there's an element of slavery, element of slavery, not that it's slavery, but the wage slave, there's something of that concept in a hired servant, while a con contractor is not a slave except unto himself. Right? Adon Latzmo, Eved Latzmo, he's, he's a slave to himself. So I... Go back to the people who are striking. Do they have a right to strike? Does one have a concept right to strike? Service contract is not susceptible to specific performance. A party in breach cannot be compelled to carry out this undertaking. Servant, on the other hand, cannot be compelled to work against his will. Law is that a worker may withdraw from employment even in the middle of the day, right? Don't like the job? You may quit. You have a right to quit. That's the, the right to strike. Even if the quitting would cause that irretrievable damage to the master, he cannot be compelled to work. There may be a right to compensation for actual damage to property, but that's a different case. Independent contractor also actually cannot be compelled to carry out an undertaken, undertaken task, but they need an agreement to compensate if there's a damage because he pulls out. Now, some thoughts on the dignity of labor. <clears throat> right? What Judaism co contributed to the value of labor and dignity of labor? They're very clear in the book of Deuteronomy, when the Ten Commandments are restated, that Shabbat is associated with liberation from bondage, and there's an emphasis on the rights of the laborer, also the non-Jew, to rest from the strictures of labor. Now, when the Romans heard about this, they were very shocked. They, they couldn't take it. The idea that one should spend one-seventh of one's life in idleness. So Tacitus, a great Roman writer, said, we're told the seventh day set aside for rest because this marked the end of their toils. In course of time, the seductions of idleness made them devote every seventh year to indolence as well. Not enough the Jews stop one out of seven days. They stop one out of seven years, these lazy no-goodniks. Right? But guess what? And they denounced Jews for it. Guess what happened to the Roman Empire, though? The Romans were catching on to the idea that you rest one day a week, and they were beginning to accept the idea of labor and a rest from labor. And it has spread around the world till it's become nearly a universal right that there's a day, at least a day of rest from labor, if not two days. I think it's become almost universal. Now, in order to make rest a sacred principle, it's because we made work a sacred principle. Right. How can you rest if you can't work? There's a phrase in Hebrew, derech eretz, which means literally the way of the world. So in Yiddish, derech eretz means to be respectful. But as I say, literally, it's the way of the world. And as it's used in rabbinic texts, it means to be meaningfully engaged in the world, especially through physical labor. And the very significant, as the rabbis are doing their teachings, and so it's about 2,000 1,500 years ago, Jewish society is transitioning from farm and labor society to mercantile and intellectual elite society. So in biblical society, the landed gentry had to be reminded of their obligations to the lower classes. But now those who work with their minds had to be reminded of their obligations to, to those who worked with their hands. So there are Eretz, according to the Midrash, it's God's great blessing to Adam when he's expelled from the Garden of Eden. Adam looks at what has happened. He's been kicked out of the Garden of Eden where everything was there to eat. And he says, shall I eat the weeds like the animals? 
God answers him, By the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat bread. Which sounds like a curse. But the rabbis, no. No, by the sweat of your brow, you will support yourself. You are undignified by this. You are elevated by the fact that you can now support yourself and turn the weed into a challah. It's the human capacity to work that enhances God's creation. So what can we say for the scholar wishes to remain in the ivy, ivory tower of the yeshiva? Great is Talmud Torah, study of Torah, combined with their Eretz, as the two together lead to the abandonment of sin. Right? If you want to be honest and honorable, you study and you work. All Talmud Torah not combined with work will in the end be nullified and lead to sin. So a great scholar, being a great scholar or a not so great scholar was not an excuse from holding a job and being responsible for a family. What goes on today in Haredi populations in Israel support themselves by political extortion, female labor, I hate to say, it, avoidance of military service is not backed by this say, statement. The great uh, scholar Hillel came to the land of Israel he came to the academy. He did not say, let me in because I want to study Torah, so I should come for free. He did not. He worked what he could to pay the price for admission. When he couldn't, he eavesdrops in and froze himself nearly to death. And that's when they let him in the academy. And so he was willing to do that. All right? It should not come easy. It should not come easy. We also taught him Pirkei Avot. It's not the Melacha. Hevet the Melacha, it's not the Rabbanut. Love, labor, and hate mastery over others. So this rabbi said, what does it mean, love, labor, love work? A person should love work and not hate work. Just as the Torah was given through a covenant, brit, so labor, work was given through a covenant. For it says, six days you shall labor, you shall labor and do all of your work. And on the seventh day is the Sabbath to your God. So the six days of work is part of the requirement in addition to the seventh day of rest. It's a covenant. That too is a covenant. Uh, no, it's to work in productive labor six days is as much divine command as rest on the Sabbath. What about the great rabbis, the great leaders themselves? So Rabbi Yudah used to go to the Beit Midrash carrying a pitcher on his shoulders, and he would say, great is work as it gives honor to the one who does it. Rabbi Shimon would carry a basket on his shoulder and say, great is work as it gives honor to the one who does it. Yeah. So the Orthodox work. The Haredim uh, make their own Torah for themselves. Who says that they're the Orthodox? Ah, that's it. They, they, they make Machzik Shabbos for himself. He does his own Shabbos by himself. He thinks that's the greatest thing on earth. Uh, ben Gurion gave the exemption in 1948 for the uh, few, there were maybe 200 students all together that had survived the Holocaust. And the rabbi said, look, this is all that's left. Recognize that this is the great tradition of the Jews. So he said, oh, 200, we need to spare some because this is part of our great cultural heritage, our great religious civilization heritage. Then he discovered there wasn't 200, it was 2,000, 20, whatever. And he complained that he had been tricked, all right, this exemption. But you know, once you have an exemption, it stays. Um, Unfortunately, the political situation is such that a handful have a stranglehold on the government. They don't want Supreme Court or anything like that. They want to protect their interests. Yeah. So they say when I, they will just try to say, when I am sitting and studying, am I sweating? Boy, am I exhausted. My mind is burnt out. Just like so many of our students in the university will also say, I'm tired from studying. It's hard work. You, know, you, you hear this, you hear this excuse. It's an excuse. So we have to give back the quote. Rabbi Chiyabar Ami said the name of Rabbi Ula. Greater is the one who benefits from the work of his hands. Right? Yigiyat kapayim, real hands. The one who fears heaven. In regards to the one who fears heaven is written, happy is the man who fears God. 
But in regard to one who benefits from his own works, it is written, when you eat from the work of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. You'll be happy in this life, well with you in the next life. In regard to one who fears heaven, the text does not say it will be well with you. This fear of heaven alone doesn't do it. Doesn't guarantee the wellness. Right? Rabbinic interpretation. So, piety may make you feel good in this life. It won't open the door to heaven. Yeah. 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 So the truth is, yeah, in an economy that we have, given the nature of the economy, we can't engage everybody in physical labor, just as we can't engage everybody in mental labor. All right. So we have a distribution of labor. Yeah, we have a distribution of labor. But what the rabbis are getting at, so many of them are upper class. And they're saying, we need to appreciate and honor people who are really struggling to make our lives possible. That's, and I think that's what they're getting at. What they don't want is a situation where everybody's just clipping coupons or with a handout on the street. When I, it, it hurts me when I, I see somebody who looks young and healthy asking for a dollar. When we're, not, we're, in a posi- we're in a period of high employment, high employment, not high unemployment. Huh? Doesn't need much qualifications. Get a paintbrush. Okay. Age is, okay, so age, but I'm looking at a young guy. And, and who has nothing, you're overqualified. You're highly qualified. But if that young guy, if he has no other training, you can go get a paintbrush. We're going to housing, housing, whatever. There are jobs, right? So this is a fear, Rabbi Zahn. Yeah. Rabbi, I grew up on a kibbutz. They work on the sh- uh, on the Shabbat because I mean yeah. you have to. Yeah, well, the beginning of the years of the kibbutz, of course, they were not religious. And Rav Cook, yeah, and Rav Cook, the ra- great rabbi, said they are creating sacred work even when they're doing something trade. So talk about the kibbutz. My that's where I'm going to get my next point. My roommate came from classical Marxist kibbutz, Hashem Atzair, yes. Marxist, Marxist, more Marxist than Marx. He, he left the kibbutz because he was going on into academic studies, but he moaned to me, complained to me, he was now a wage slave, slavery, because he had to earn his day. In the kibbutz, you work, you don't work, you, you sit down, you take it easy, then you work. Yeah, go ahead. The cow, yeah. So they have they have workarounds for the and the religious kibbutz team. They have uh, uh, they they have uh, automated milking systems. No, they keep it. They keep it. They use it. I think I'm. The, I, it was a good question. Uh, then you're in Baltash, hit your waist. And the problem with that. All right, but let's get back. My point. My point. My point. So most of us are past that point. Listen, we're either we're getting some kind of pension, or we have some investments. We're getting a little bit past the, the daily grind for a lot of us, right? So still, we need to pause and reflect how much we depend on the labor of those who are struggling for their daily bread. We hope that the strikers get fair and good working conditions. And we hope that we get to an economy where people can maybe move away from backbreaking labor where machines can take over the hard part of labor for us and we can focus on the creative part right that would be a great thing right? we're hoping that's what will happen down the road and not that we're going to have the computer replacing the rabbi 
<laughs> right? Uh, and of course, employers always have to remember, like uh, Henry Ford remembered, you have to have an you have to have consumers to buy what you make. So if your consumers are working and they're not making, they can't buy what you're making. So you have to make sure that your consumer is gainfully employed and comfortable. This, this is always going to be that contradiction in a capitalist society. You're always going to have the one who has the capital and the one who makes the capital possible. So that's where the unions have their function. Unions are not necessarily unions. You have political pressure to guarantee in the way laws are written to protect their interests and so on. Uh, but no, but I think there also there, there are other issues also because the entire nature of the film and TV industry is undergoing a rapid shift, paradigm shift. And now how do you track who's getting paid for what because of streaming? These, these are their big fears. Or that they would be, you know, one image of an actor would be replicated ad infinitum. You pay him $5 an hour for the one image. And then, so those are, those are some of the key issues, some of the very key issues. They're difficult issues, they're difficult issues. The studios also have their problems because the whole industry is uh, facing a uh, seismic shift. Where's cable television? Where are the traditional channels? Who watches traditional channels anymore uh, when everything is on streaming? Right? Things like that. So, uh, I wanted to add that recently we have a famous uh, politician uh, who was uh, other people are using his image you talk about it, it was like bug talks and research, and uh, because that you can see them because it, he doesn't own the intellectual property. Yeah, yeah. The state of Georgia. Oh, it's instead of Georgia using a politician. Yeah. yeah. And, and, then, and then we have a mugshot of a past president that is very profitable to the past president. Because, yeah, but himself, he's making the money. Okay. What can I say? All right, to everybody. Have a enjoyable, uh, happy Labor Day, and thank God to people who kept LA and kept the country open with the sweat of their brows. And we have to appreciate them. Shabbat shalom to everybody.